You can open up to, as they're taking the offering, you can open up to Psalms 88. And uh, Psalms 88, that's a, this is a tough one, okay? And, and I'm calling it this morning, questions that we can't talk about. Questions that we can't ask. And there's a lot of questions we feel as Christians we cannot ask because it might um, cause us to doubt. We can never ask questions about, or ask questions to God about our situation. We as Christians and as Americans don't like to spend a lot of time lamenting things. Not only do we like to question, but or we don't feel like we can question sometimes, but we also don't like to lament. We all kind of have our hobby horses. You know, we might lament when our favorite team trades our favorite pitcher. Or sometimes we might lament when our political leaders don't do the things that we want or, or we don't get the political leader that we want. Or we might lament a situation at work. But, you know, there's a lot of different things that we will semi-lament. But outside of that, we don't want people to understand that our life is difficult. We don't like people to know that we have a hard life sometimes. We want to make everyone think that our life is perfect. If something is hard, or if we are in a season of suffering or trials, we just try to get out of it. We don't want to feel the hurt or the pain. But is that right? We can learn a lot in our pain if we go about it the right way. Asking hard questions or lamenting current situations a lot of times actually helps us get to a better perspective. A lament is something that is uh, meant to help a person feel more deeply the brokenness or sorrow of a particular moment and not just run from it. We mourn better when we don't always hide from current situations. I also think a lot of times we don't want heaven because we don't allow ourselves to feel the brokenness of this world. Lamenting helps us get ready for heaven and it shows us our need for Jesus. When we don't allow our soul to feel the emptiness of this world, we will not see the fullness of Jesus. The gospel is really good news for those who know they need it. But a lot of us don't functionally think we need it because we don't fully understand our own sorrow. Here in Psalms 88, we see one of the darkest Psalms in the whole Bible. We see him question God, we hear him with deep laments and in the end, it stays that way. It stays that way. God purposefully put this chapter in the Bible. And I think it's here to help us think about questions and lamentations. We don't, I don't think everything that Heman, the guy who wrote this psalm, I don't think everything he's saying here is theologically true. I don't think he's making a theological statement. I think he is giving us an emotional outburst of his current situation. But I think it's what he's feeling and God thinks it's important enough to put that in scripture. If we are willing to take time and think it has also helped us uh, and gives us the freedom to feel hurt and pain in a deeper way that is more helpful and not destructive. We think pain is always destructive and if something is causing us pain or allowing us to hurt, it's bad. When we learn to lament in the right way, it helps us feel lost and have a deeper understanding of who God is. And that's what Psalms 88 this morning is all about. And the big idea this morning that we get is um, that questions of lament are important parts of our faith. Questions of lament are important parts of our faith. And if we are gonna grow in our faith and understanding of God, we need to learn how to lament and question well. And here we see a Psalm 88. It's a Psalm of the sons of Korah. These guys are a bunch of worship leaders in the temple and specifically written by a, guy, a, a, a man by the name of He-Man. 
That's a great name, He-Man. Maybe it's He-Man, the Ezraite. But it's by the He-Man. And you know, one of the things that's unique about this is we, in the very name of the psalm, we get some light because this is a dark psalm. At the same time, we know that this same guy wrote several other psalms that are just full of God's glory and God's joy. And a lot of times to get to that point, you gotta have some of these darker moments. But here in Psalms 88, I hope as we learn uh, what it looks like to question and lament well, we understand how that plays an important part of our faith. The first thing that we see in Psalms 88 this morning is that the starting point matters. The starting point matters. Look at how he starts out the psalm. He says, oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline my heart or incline your ear to my cry. And here, when you look at Psalms 88, this is actually the most hopeful part in all of the psalm. Uh, This is actually the one part where we really see an acknowledgement of human's faith in this moment. He he starts out by crying out, oh, Lord God of my salvation. That word Lord, there is the term Yahweh. And we've talked about this before, but the term Yahweh was God's covenant name to his people. And so the very way that he is choosing to acknowledge God is in the, the covenant form that this is the God literally of his salvation. And he goes on to, to say, and he's, before he goes into a, a moment of lament, he's declaring for himself and all of those around him to hear and remember that this is coming from a place where they understand that they are only saved by God. And they're coming to God with questions, but it's the God of their salvation, the God who is in control of their life. And he says, let my prayer come before you. Even in human's darkest moments, he's continuing to pray, understanding that his only answer can be found in his prayers to God. He says, I cry out to you day and night. This is a never ending this is the, the, the uh, dark night of the soul crying out to God. And he's begging him, incline your ear to me. And he's reminding us that it's important to have a good um, starting place. If we're gonna ask the right questions of God in a way that helps us lament our situation, we have to do it from the perspective of God, our Savior. Now, I had a um, a professor in college at one point in time, and when I took this professor, um, everyone was like, oh, Jesse, you're gonna hate this guy. He's an older guy, a a theology prof. And most people thought that he just made fun of everyone. And, uh, and I was somebody who I didn't know a ton. And so I just asked a ton of questions and everybody kind of knew that. And so they all said, Jesse, you're just gonna get demolished by this guy. So when I, I kind of went into his class a little bit with fear and trembling and um, one of the things I realized as I started to take this guy was w- what he didn't like is the people who would come in and play stump the professor. So if you came into the class and you were just trying to prove yourself to everyone else or try to make yourself look smart or try to make this professor look dumb, he's going to lay you flat out. Like he is going to totally show himself or his authority over you. At the same time, when I would come to him and I would ask questions because I didn't know, like I had a lot I had to learn. I would, I asked questions all the time. He was gracious with me. He was compassionate towards me. And this guy is this oldest, one of the oldest, most people call crotchety old theology professors came alongside of this young 21-year-old Jesse who knew absolutely nothing and, and gave me a lot of the theology I now have today because I, I just wanted to learn. I didn't know. Um, but it was this kind of stump the professor type of thing that, that, he, that he didn't let people come to him at all in this way. And when we're talking about questioning God and bringing our, God, our questions to God, we need to have the right foundation. If we're going to God because we don't like what he's saying, if we're going to God to prove God wrong, there are a lot of people who are questioning God out there who are just questioning God because they don't like what God says. That's not gonna give us good answers. That's not gonna allow us to ask the questions right. But when we start from the place of God, God of my salvation, you are the only one 
That's the place that we want to start from. Declaring who God is first, then allows us to ask the right questions later on. Here's the thing. God can handle our questions in doubt. God can handle the things that we find difficult, but we need to understand that he's the only one that we can go to to really find those answers. So after he, after he starts out and just setting the foundation of where he is going to ask these questions, and from this moment on, it's all negative. And for me, this moment on, he even goes and just asks question after question. So my points this morning are all questions, and I'm trying to ask them in a way that helps us understand some of the questions that we might be asking that we want to learn to lament and feel in a little bit different way. And the first one is, have I been cut off? Have I been cut off? And Heman here gives us a picture of his life and how he is feeling. He is not feeling like one of God's chosen, but instead of one who's on the doorstep of death. And he feels like he has been cut off from those who are outside of God's promise. Look what he says starting in verse three. He says, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more. For they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions of the dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I'm shut in so I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim, therefore, my eyes grow dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord, and I spread out my hands before you. So here, after Heman kind of lays the foundation of who God is, then he goes right into his moment and Heman's inner self is distraught. And he feels as if he is close to death. And as we kind of read through and just try to understand what's going on, it's probably both a physical and a spiritual death that Heman is referring to. He starts out by right away from the very beginning, for my soul is full of troubles. This is a man who is in a deep, dark place. This isn't just a momentary affliction, but both physically and spiritually, Heman is feeling the oppression to the point where he feels like dying. He says, my life draws near to shield, literally to hell or death, that I am being drawn down to this place. He says, I am counted among those who go down to the pit. He's, he's separating himself out from where he should be, which is in God's covenant people, understanding the blessings of God. And he's saying, I don't count myself among them, but I count myself among those who are going down to the pit. I am like those who are outside of God's blessing, who are experiencing spiritual and physical death. I'm a man who has no strength. I spiritually cannot figure out how to get out of this, Lord. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those who you remember no more. And not only in this first part, he's talking about he, he feels like someone going to death, but then the, the second section over here, he's, he's not only, he's talking about that I feel like this, but I also feel like this is from your hand. He says like, that you remember no more that they have been cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit. Your wrath lies heavy on me. You overwhelm me with your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. He even understands that this is from the hand of God to some extent. And uh, Heman probably, uh, like the rest of the Israelites at different times, would sin and, and live a life and walk away from God and there would be punishment from God and finally they get to the place of repentance in God and sometimes even when they would repent, God would allow them to suffer under it a little while. And as Heman is there, he's feeling separated from God from his own things. He's feeling separated from God, from God pouring out things on him. I've been cut off. My eyes grow dim. God, I'm calling out to you. And it sounds like you're not listening. 
He's asking the question, have I been cut off? Have I been cut off? This is someone who because of their life wasn't fully devoted to God, but God who was near, was not near to them, Heman, or did not feel near to them, Heman is feeling the fallout of that. Like he's been cut off from God and his blessings of life. And he essentially asked God in a sense of mourning, God, am I really dead? Am I really cut off? That's a good place to be sometimes. Not because we want to be distant from God, but to remember what it's like without God. To remember what it's like without God. Sometimes we're like um, Kevin from Home Alone, Home Alone 2. When he wakes up on the plane, if you haven't seen Home Alone 2, it's your fault. Uh, but he wakes up on the plane that's supposed to be going to Florida and is actually in the middle of winter New York. And if you remember right, okay, it's a long series of unfortunate events. They uh, wake up late to go to the airport the second time. And uh, they come in, he's carrying his little microphone and his microphone runs out of batteries. And so he wants batteries from his dad. So his dad hands him his bag and he stops to put batteries in and his family runs off through O'Hare, the worst airport in the world. Just trust me on this one. And as he's running and trying to put his batteries in, he loses sight of his dad. And then he looks up and he sees a guy who he thinks is his dad, okay? And uh, so he starts following that guy. And finally he gets to the gate and he runs into the lady and all the tickets, because they don't have iPhones at the time, all the tickets go flying. And then he's like, says, well, I got to load, I'm late. And she says, you're right, you're late. Are you sure you're on this flight? Yes, I'm on this flight. That's my dad down there. And he sees the guy in the same coat. So she lets him on and he runs in and, and then the lady helps him sit. Do you see your family? Yeah, my, uh, my dad's right there. Same guy with the coat. Then he sits down, okay? And he starts asking the guy next to him, hey, are you excited about flying to Florida? The guy only speaks French, right? This guy only speaks French. So, and then he puts his headphones on. So when the flight attendants start talking about that they're flying to New York, he can't hear them because he has his headphones on. And then he falls asleep and he wakes up in New York. <sighs> Sometimes that's kind of our spiritual journey. Uh, there are times where we think that we're walking the narrow path and we're being faithful, but our heart is going after all their gods. Our heart is pursuing false worship. We're slipping on our devotions. We're, we're being overstressed at work. There's lots of things going on. And then all of a sudden we look up and we're not where we're supposed to be. We are not spiritually aligned with the Lord and we wake up and realize we feel spiritually dead. And that church, we want to repent of that. We want to turn back to the Lord. But sometimes we get to that place and we want to just jump right back to where we were before. But sometimes God leaves us there for a little bit. Sometimes God lets us feel that moment of separation from God. And not that we are separated, but God lets us feel. And that's not necessarily bad. Why? Why should we lament that separation? Why should we feel that a little bit deeper? Because when we understand what it feels like without God, we want God all the more. Our convictions for our relationship grow when we understand, when we feel what it's really like to be separated from God. And when God allows those moments of spiritual darkness, and when God allows those times when he lets you feel that a little bit, don't run from it. But stay there, understand exactly what Heman does here and says, Lord, I feel like I'm dead. I feel like I'm cut off. Lord, this is terrible. And what that does is that gives us a greater longing and desire for God. Don't just run from that moment. At the same time, it also allows us to understand Jesus better. Because you know what happened on the cross? When Jesus took all of our sin, God turned his face away. You and I cannot understand Jesus until we've suffered to the point where we feel like God has turned his face away from us. And church, I promise you, God doesn't turn his face away from us. God is faithful to forgive. God has the grace and mercy to overcome all things. At the same time, he does allow us to suffer. He does allow us to go through things to give us a greater desire for himself. And when God allows us a season like that, lament over it. Ask those questions. Go before the throne of God and say, God, I feel this way. Why? So that then we have a deeper understanding and appreciation for the presence of God. And at the same time, we can have a greater understanding of the suffering that Jesus took on our behalf on the cross when God turned his face away. Have I been cut off? Second question, does my suffering nullify God's love and promises? 
Does my suffering nullify God's love and promises? He then jumps into three questions that we see in verses 10 through 12. Four questions. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up and praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in a baden? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? So here we see Heman going to these four rhetorical questions, which the obvious answer is no. But at the same time, they frame a way to ask God, if you really are my salvation, how do I understand that in light of my current situation? God, if my promises and our covenant, your covenant to us, if this is the outcome is your kingdom in life, why does my current situation look so different than that? He is following what he was feeling in the first couple of verses that he was on his way to death, which was opposite of God's covenant promise. God, if you really are my savior, like we declared in the first couple of verses, God, if I really, if you really are the Yahweh of my life, how does my life look so different? God, am I really dead that you can do these things? This cannot be the outcome. And so he asked these questions, Lord, do you work wonders from the dead? Lord, we're supposed to be your covenant people and you're supposed to do wonders in us so that we can display it to a world that is watching, to, we can display it to the nations. But if I'm dead, that can't happen. Lord, do the departed, do those who have died, do they raise up and praise you like we're supposed to do? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave? God, if I'm dead, can I give you praise? Can I declare the way that you've loved me if I've died? Or your faithfulness in abaddon. Lord, the, the word abaddon literally means death. It's another term for, for hell. And he's saying, Lord, is your faithfulness shown to those who've gone to the pit? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of the forgetfulness? Lord, if, if my life is really this way, how are your wonders gonna be known? Can those who no longer think of the goodness of you show your righteousness? No, 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 no. Then if that's the case, How do I understand my current situation? Because I feel like I am all of these things, God. Does that mean that I am not one of those saved by you? Here again, Heman is feeling the weight of the already, but not yet. Death is still a reality and destruction that cannot be totally eradicated until Jesus returns. And see, here's the the feeling. This is what, you know, he is kind of growing through right now. He understands that God is the God of his salvation. And he understands that God is bringing a kingdom that's going to last forever. But until Jesus returns, first for the first time in his case, the second time in our case, that's not going to be fully experienced. And because of sin and death, Heman and the rest of us are still going to feel the brokenness of that. And there are going to be a lot of times where we don't feel like the kingdom of God is at hand. There's going to be a lot of times where we don't feel like we can worship God like he's called us. There's going to be a lot of times where we feel like we are dying and I have no way of showing God's wondrous deeds. So how do we understand that? Well, we got to understand God a little bit better. A lot of times we think that if something is blue, it cannot be red. If something is up, it cannot be down. If something is good, it cannot be bad. And a lot of times we put God in that perspective. We think about God, God, if you are good and holy, you promised me all of these things, then these bad things cannot happen. But suffering can happen in God's blessing. The goodness of God and the pain of this life, uh, they still happen simultaneously in our life and God uses them all. 
And one of the times, there's a lot of times when we feel like Heman here, it's like, Lord, I'm supposed to be able to declare your steadfast love, but I just feel like I'm in the grave. What is going on? Both of those things can be simultaneously true. And we want to feel both of those things. We want to understand that we do have God's steadfast love, but at the same time, we feel like we're dead because of this life. And and we do that because in moments like this, we need to bring those doubts to God. God, can I do what I'm supposed to because of your love for me when I'm suffering under the consequences of sin and death like I am? And it's good for us to lament this fact and feel it because it helps us understand that this life isn't the final fulfillment of God's blessing. We will not fully experience the kingdom of God here. And when we learn to lament these moments and not just run from them, but when when we feel as this dichotomy where it's like, all right, God, you're supposed to be faithful and good, but I'm suffering and have pain. What is going on? But we understand that both of these things can be simultaneously true and that we don't need to run from that pain, but allow that pain to give us a greater appreciation for the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. There will be times of life when it feels like all the blessing from God are gone and this should make us long for heaven more. It should also help us understand the destructiveness of death. Death really is the final enemy of God. And the only person who has power over death is Jesus Christ. And when you and I understand, when we kind of live in this already but not yet, when we battle between these two things, it is not wrong to feel the brokenness. It is not wrong to allow yourself to to struggle through, God, if I'm suffering, does this nullify your promises? God, does this show me that your love is not true? And, And it's okay to ask that question and to struggle through it and to wrestle through that suffering and and feel that suffering and pain in light of, even in light of God's promises. Because it gives us a greater appreciation for the coming kingdom of God. God, does my suffering nullify your love and promises? Third question, God, do you hear me? Am I all alone? God, do you hear me? Am I all alone? Good. Heman says, starting in verse 13, he says this, but I, O Lord, cry to you in the morning, or in the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assault destroys me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. Lastly, he ends by saying and asking God, why? I have called to you and you've hidden yourself from me. I've called to you and you've afflicted me. You hear, Heman is showing that even in this lament and question, he's still crying out to God. Even as he's understanding and working through some of these difficult questions in his life, he's still crying out, but you, oh Lord, I cry to you in the morning. My prayer comes before you. But even when he prays, he's still feeling the separation from God. God, why do you cast my soul away? God, why is my soul, why is my heart and my longing so far from you? Why do I not feel your presence like I have in the past? Why do you hide your face from me? Man, look at verse 15, man, that's intense. Afflicted and close to death from my youth up. This is something that's been going on in his life from the time he's been a child. 
This has been a, a suffering. I mean, one of the, um, growing up in ministry and seeing my dad kind of struggle through a lot of these things and then reading a lot of different biographies about ministers and pastors and people in ministry, one of the things that blows my mind is how often uh, some of the most faithful people in all of Christianity have suffered their entire life from depression, from anxiety, from dark nights of the soul. And God allows that. Heman's feeling that right here. Lord, from the youth, from my, from my youth afflicted, I suffer terrors, I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me, God. This is from your hand. And again, like, I don't think he's saying that, that he is um, totally outside of. I, I think he understands he's still inside of God's covenant love, but what he's declaring is how he's feeling, what, he, what is going on inside of his soul at this moment. They surround me like a flood all the day long. He's, being, he's drowning in the separation that he feels from God. But only that, now is God not listening or he feels like God is not listening? He says, you've caused my beloved, my, my wife and my friends to shun me. My companions have become darkness. You have separated me from all of the community around me. And you know what happens? The chapter ends. It's done. That's the way you end this? This psalm is in the Bible? What on earth? Like I literally looked at this chapter so many times this week. I'm like, God, why is this in the Bible? How do I preach this? But sometimes we need this. See, here's the thing. Heman finished his prayer. Heman finished his prayer. Even in the worst moment of his life, in one of the messiest seasons, even when he didn't fully know how to pray, he still, and it was a prayer of lament and suffering, but he prayed and he finished. And in this, I do not think Heman was necessarily always expressing what he knew to be true, but he was expressing what he was feeling to be true at the moment. But it was a prayer of what he felt, what was happening, and God heard it, and God put it in his book. Because we need it. Sometimes we just need to be reminded that in our suffering and in our lament, we just need to finish that prayer. Sometimes that's the only hope that we have is falling on our face and saying, God, why? God, what is going on? And then trusting God to do what he's gonna do with that prayer request. Sometimes it's like a marathon runner who's been training all of his life and then one mile into that falls and busts his knee. And the rest of that race is just him trying to finish. And when he crosses that race six hours longer than he wants to, it's just the fact that he got done. And sometimes that's our prayer life, and that's okay. Even in our worst and messiest prayers, God hears our prayers, and he can handle it. But we need to keep it coming. In the darker night of our soul, when our morning prayers are no lighter, even though the sun just came up, just like Job, we need to be persistent in petitioning God with our prayers and with our questions and with our doubts. Even when we don't understand, we need to understand the greatest thing that we can do is just go before God. And again, just like humans have been going back in time or back and forth, or back and forth, or back and forth, God, why, God, why, God, why? It's okay. As long as we start from the place of understanding, God, you are the God of our savior, but God, I don't fully understand why you have me in this season right now. And then just be done. And trust that God knows what he's doing and learning to just lament that moment. And sometimes that's the best place for us because when we get to that place, we understand, we have a deeper understanding of the brokenness of this world. We have a deeper understanding of our sorrow. The pain that we have isn't something that should be run from, but should be given over 
And even as we do that, we experience a little bit of what Jesus experienced on our behalf. And the more that you and I understand and experience suffering and pain and handle it in the right way and learn to lament it so that we can see the brokenness of it, the greater the glories of God are gonna look. The greater the gospel of Jesus Christ is gonna be And you and I do not appreciate Jesus enough because we do not handle our suffering right. Our pain gives us a perspective of Jesus that nothing else can. And asking the questions that we're not supposed to ask are sometimes the best thing that we can do. God, are you really listening to me? God, am I cut off from you? I feel dead right now. Jesus felt that. Lord, I feel like I can't bring my suffering in line with your love and promises. God, how do I handle that? That's a feeling of the disjointedness of the already, but not yet. The do you hear me? Am I all alone? You know who else felt that? Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, when he was on the way to the cross and he said, God, take this cup from me. And God didn't answer that prayer request. It's not the way that Jesus wanted in that moment. And when we go through these moments, we learn to lament right in these moments. We can understand Jesus better. But that means we gotta take time to do it. Sometimes you gotta feel that pain. And it doesn't mean that we sit there and wallow in it and become woe is me, but that means that we feel that brokenness and bring Jesus into it. We fight with God in prayer, trusting that God knows what he's doing. We don't just try to make everything better because it's not gonna get better until Jesus comes back again. But ultimately we understand that Jesus sits with us in that moment. Flip over to Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 gives us a great perspective of how to understand this psalm. Because a lot of times we're like, all right, Jesse, if that's true, like why would God let me go through suffering? Why would God do this to me? One, God isn't allowing us to do anything that he hasn't already done. Christ suffered far more on our behalf than you and I will ever suffer. At the same time, God doesn't leave us alone in our suffering. Look at Psalm 53, it is a uh, prophet, a prof, it's prophesying about the coming Messiah. Look at what it says, starting in verse three. It says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom, whom men hide their face, He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief and carries our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with the wounds we are healed, with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid him uh, on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, uh, he was taken away and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And he put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper at his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. 
and he shall bear their iniquities. Church, Christ suffered on our behalf so deeply. You know, so often you and I don't appreciate the work of the cross because you and I don't understand the depravity of our own souls. And uh, sometimes we need Psalms like Psalms 88. Psalms that remind us to lament that moment, to ask the hard questions, to feel the brokenness, to not just run from our pain and suffering, but to understand what it's there for. It's there to give us a greater appreciation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's there to make us long more deeply for the coming kingdom. It's there for us to understand Jesus more. So we shouldn't run from it. We shouldn't just lose it. We shouldn't just do the American thing and make it all better and don't let anybody in. But we should understand it. We should lament over it. Ask God questions. God can deal with our messy prayers. God can handle our doubts. God has every ability to be able to pull us from our mire, but we got to understand we're there first. So this week, I encourage you. When God brings pain, when God allows suffering, when you look up and realize I'm not in the place that I should be, don't run from that brokenness, but feel it, understand, man, this is what it means to be, se- this is what it feels like to be separated from God. I don't want that anymore. When you feel that suffering, and you're trying to understand how to relate that God, how do I understand my suffering in line with your love? Those two things can go hand in hand. And that suffering is reminding me that the fulfillment of God's love isn't coming until Christ comes back again. And that we're still living in a broken world. Sometimes when all you can do is finish that broken prayer, just finish it. Just throw it before the Lord and trust that he knows what he's doing. Lament, ask questions and then trust God. Church, we're messy people. We are all desperately broken and that's okay because that's where Jesus meets us. He was crushed for our iniquities. And that's a glorious thing. So as we sing these last two songs, I'd encourage you, just take some time. Um, You can stand, you can sit, you can, however you want, but just take some time. If you've been going through a season of pain and you've been just trying to get out from under it, don't run from it. Lament over it. Feel that brokenness. If you've been running from God, living a life where you haven't been honoring the work of God in you and you're looking around, you're like, man, my life is not where it's supposed to be. Feel that a little bit so that it burdens you with a conviction to pursue God all the more. If you're fighting for prayer, man, just fight to finish that prayer. Give God that prayer and just let it be. It doesn't have to be perfect. God can take that and use that just like he did here in Psalms 88. And so as we're singing these songs, I just encourage you, pray over God, show me these ways. Show me how to lament. Well, help me understand that uh, questions and lamenting are an important part of our faith even today. So we can have a deeper appreciation and understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus went through in our behalf, amen. Amen, let's pray. God, we come before you this morning. Lord, and we thank you for Psalms, even like Psalms 88. Where, Lord, sometimes it takes us a while to go through and read through and pursue. And God, just asking the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom. But God, even as we understand this, God, we understand that we don't have to have all of these things figured out. But God, that you already do. And because of that, Lord, that we can come to you with our questions and lamentations. Lord, that we can come to you in our broken prayers and when we don't ever understand everything. God, that we can feel the brokenness of this world. God, that we can ask the hard questions because you are the one who has it all figured out. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that doesn't run from our messiness, but God, that we would feel the brokenness. God, giving us a deeper longing for the coming kingdom of heaven. God, I pray that we would be a people who understand at least to a little bit the suffering that Jesus went through on our behalf because we don't run from our suffering. 
because we bring it to you. God, I pray that we would be a church that even when all of our prayers are just messy prayers, that we just continue to press in and pursue you in prayer because that's the only hope that we have. And God, that they wouldn't have to be pretty, but God, that we would just trust you with our mess. I think I just like Heman asked in his unanswered prayer, Lord, why? Why, God, give us answers. Lord, I pray for anybody who is in this room this morning, Lord, who's been going through times of suffering. God, I pray for people who are in seasons of pain. Lord, I pray that you would meet them in their prayers. Give them the ability to pray through their suffering. Give them the ability to feel their brokenness so that they have a greater appreciation for you. God, I pray that we would know our Savior deeply because we suffer rightly. God, let's not be perfect people, but let us be gospel-fixed people. And God, let our prayers show that. And God, as we close this morning in time of worship, and God, I pray that we would be reminded yet again of the faithfulness of Jesus on our behalf so that we can lament and ask tough questions. Lord, because you have it all figured out. So God, again, we just ask that you get all the praise and glory this morning in Jesus' name.